So please welcome all the way from New York, John Pliny Aramick. Thanks. <laughs> so I've been trying to come out and do this for the last couple of years. Michael and I have been trading emails since like 2016. Um, so I'm glad I was finally able to actually make it out. What you didn't tell me, Michael, is that I would be following Walter Murch. Thank you. Um, yeah, I give up. I go. Um, the reason uh, I'm here tonight is uh, up until July, I had a day job. Um, and crawl is something that started seven years ago, almost as a side project. Our first year we had 16 films. Our second year we had 39 films, and it kept growing. Um, we crossed the 1,000 film mark about a year and a half ago. Thanks. <laughs> um, and if, if you'll permit me to, to, to brag for a second, while we were waiting for Walter to show up, I pulled out my phone. I was like, oh, Coup 53, interesting. I wonder, nah, it can't be. Yes, they used Encrawl. So if it's good enough for, for, for them, um, hopefully it's good enough for everyone else. It is awesome, right? And so did Making Waves, crazy. Um, so this is me. Um, I, uh, little quick little history, I used to run a post-production boutique in New York City. It was called Off Hollywood. I don't know if any of you guys have ever heard of Off Hollywood. You probably heard of the red camera. Um, we owned the first two, basically the first two red cameras. So serial numbers one, two, three, four, five belonged to the founder of Red, Jim, and serial numbers six and seven were, were our cameras. So. Um, I did that for about eight years. After that, I went to HBO. I was at HBO doing workflow for another six years. And like I said, I just quit my day job in July, and now this is the, the only thing I do. So I'm really excited to be here. This is the first time I'm in LA on my own business as Ncrawl, as opposed to as HBO or something else. All right, so, thanks. Um, so that's me. Please uh, reach out, email me anytime. Um, the link at the bottom, that's a special link for everyone in this room right now, ncrawl.com slash LACpug, or I don't know how you pronounce that, Mike, but when I said to my wife, she's like, Lacey Pug, because now I can only imagine is a dog in sort of ruffles, and it's a, it's a Lacey Pug. Lacey Pug. Uh, Lassie Pug, okay. Um, anyways, um, that, so 90% so of everyone who's ever signed up for Ncrawl on the internet has gone on a wait list because the world is full of YouTubers and people making short films and film students and lots of other folks that I can't wait to accommodate, but we're not quite ready for that huge um, influx just yet. So we do a little bit of gatekeeping just to make sure that are you a working professional in film and video? Do you actually have a film? It doesn't matter if it's like a $50,000 Kickstarter movie, we'll let everyone in, but we try to keep the looky-loos at bay. If you use that link, you'll skip the, the wait list and we'll give you a demo project right, right away. Um, and there's a link there for swag too, I'll talk about that in a sec. But basically, I, I promised Michael I would, um, I'd bring coupons, I'd bring little cards for Ncrawl t-shirts, and then I handed them all out this week before I got here. So instead, um, I made that link and everyone in this room can have um, free Ncrawl swag. So I just decided to give stuff to everybody. All right, woohoo! But well, you guys are really stoked about end credits. It's awesome. Um, <laughs> all right, so um, I'm just going to talk over this. I decided when I heard I was going to have 20 minutes to talk, I wasn't going to give you guys a 20 minute demo of the product. Um, if you want to check out Ncrawl, like I said, sign up. You can get a demo account. I'd be happy to get on the phone with you. I'd be happy to do a, a, a video call. And I have a really awesome support team, too. So I'd love to show you the product one-on-one um, -on -one or however you, however you like. If you're in the New York area, we can meet up, too. Um, I've got an office in the city there. But um, what I really wanted to tell you really quickly about Ncrawl is three things. One, it's a browser-based tool. There's nothing to download. There's nothing to install. It's, it's a SaaS product, software as a service. Um, number two. It gives you unlimited redos. With end credits, there's always another typo. There's always another fix. Um, we typically see our customers still making revisions between six and 12 months after they do have their festival premiere. So end, crawl, end credits are never, never done. Yes, someone in here is not. <laughs> it happens. Um, and when I was running off Hollywood, that was my problem too. Either I was the person making the end credits, an illustrator, an After Effects, or I was managing the process with a designer and everyone hated it. 
the client was frustrated, the designers are frustrated, everyone's frustrated because there's, uh, every time there was a fix, we're round tripping Excel docs over email, like it's 1997, um, where you had to wait a day to get another output, the renders are really slow, at some point someone goes, I'm gonna charge you overages because this is the 87th revision. Um, with Ncrawl, everything's in the cloud. The project is always live. You gotta go, you make a sale, you gotta put four more names back in the credits, you gotta probably name check the CFO of the distributor or something like that. Um, you don't, you're not chasing down a project file, you're not trying to find the artist who did it, it's just there. Anyone can use this, and about two-thirds of our customer base are non-technical producers and post-production supervisors. So we built something that really is, is easy to use. And every time you want to get another output, another render, you click a button, you can probably see it in the video that's playing in the background here. We have a render engine that sits in the cloud. <clears throat> a preview render, that's just H.264, takes about two, three minutes to turn around. Fully uncompressed, 4K DPX, we deliver right now an, an average just under 20 minutes. And you can do that hundreds of times if you want, I don't care, because servers are cheap. <laughs> Um, it's only human beings and marketing that costs money. Um, all the underlying technology infrastructure is pretty inexpensive by comparison. So you can, per film, you can make an unlimited number of revisions and we never whack you for overages. Um, <laughs> all right, great, that was two. Yeah, and the third thing is, um, we'll give you a week of your life back. A, um, a post-production supervisor I know, when we were just getting started, our first year, seven years ago, called me up and he's like, Pliny, um, I'm working on four films right now, and to my horror, all four got into Sundance. So this guy is not sleeping, he's not eating, he's not doing anything, and he's like, I heard you can help me with end credits, that you, you started something. So fast forward three days later, he's made the end credits for all four of his films with many, many, many revisions in between. So when I say I'll give you a week of your life back, I'm not joking. Um, but what I thought I'd do tonight, and by the way, I didn't want to talk here for, for 15 minutes, so feel free to interrupt, feel free to raise your hands if you've got a question. Um, but what I wanted to do is, is um, give you a few pitfalls, common pitfalls to avoid when you're managing this process. How many people here are an editor? Just, just curious, editor, AEs, everybody, awesome. So have you ever heard make the editor do it? Like when it comes to, <laughs> um, this will probably come across your, your desk or your desktop at some point. How many people here are post supervisors or producers? Okay, a little less. How many people here have ever made their own film or know that before they die, because you have a script rattling around in your head or rattling around in the back of your drawer, are gonna make your own film? Come on, I wanna see every hand go up. Okay, I know, we're all filmmakers here, right? Cool, so this is gonna touch your life in some way at some point. You're gonna have to make end credits. So um, I'm going to give you five things, five pitfalls to avoid when you're, when you're managing this process or in any way involved. Um, we're gonna talk about how long credits should be. We're going to talk about the jitter. I think a lot of people here know why the jitter happens, but I'm going to maybe tell you one or two things you don't know. Um, I'm going to talk about Helvetica. <laughs> hang on, hang on. I, I worked on the documentary Helvetica. I'm a huge fan of Helvetica, but it's wrong for this, and I'll tell you why. Um, we're going to talk about how you can cost your production a ton of money um, by accident, and then we'll, we'll talk about that no animals thing real quick. All right, so um, before that, a very brief history um, why this is such a big pain in the, pain in the butt kind of problem. These are the end titles to Wizard of Oz. That's it. That's, it. That's the screen. It's, it's 11 names and one of them's a dog, all right? Um, <laughs> and then the midgets, the midgets are down there, not broken out, the flying monkeys, not credited. Doug Trumbull's father worked on the movie, didn't get credited, all right? All right? So in, in those days, it wasn't very common just to sort of, you know, give everyone their due. Um, that tiny little strip you see down, running down the side, uh, those are the end titles to Lord of the Rings. And we've done some that are about that insane. In fact, the craziest ones I've ever seen are Chinese co-productions, because apparently when you make films in China, you have to name check every local um, dignitary of the, of, the, of the Communist Party. And so there'll be blocks and blocks of like every town where production happened, there's all these people being name checked, 80, 90 different logos in it. So crazy stuff. Um, and that gets very difficult to manage. But, so let's talk, about, um, let's talk about how long end credits should be. Because this is a very sort of complex and, no, actually, no, it's not. It's four minutes. All right, the answer is four minutes. <laughs> um, we've seen some that go close to 10. That's kind of excessive. Usually those are tentpole movies. Those are studio films. 
with like hundreds of roto artists, hundreds of drivers, stunt, dri uh, stunt, uh, stunt men, and so forth. But over the years, I keep going back to this question, and since we've done over a thousand films, we have a ton of data. So I can sort of run the average, and it's, it's held remarkably steady right around the four minute mark with a, like a few seconds more, a few seconds less over time. So if you're making an independent film, you don't want to know how much time you should block out for your end credits, just make it four minutes. Um, and I say this because lately I've had some directors roll up and they're like, we left a minute and 20 seconds for our credits. That's really bad, because um, you're not going to want to scroll. Even if you're doing cards, it's going to be like cut, cut, cut. It's going to feel like, like the Simpsons end credits or something. It's just going to be like every screen is a few frames. Um, but you can't do a nice scroll at 24p um, when, you're, when you have to get through it in a minute and change. Um, not unless you're uh, Ang Lee and you're shooting at 120 frames per second. <laughs> that will probably look smooth, but 24p, white on black, perfectly geometric motion is sort of the, a perfect storm for um, stuff looking jittery. So you have to make sure that you give yourself enough time. I saw um, uh, Doug Trumbull, I mentioned him a second ago, uh, speak at Able Cinetech a number of years ago, and he was talking about doing the star fields in 2001. And what he noted is you couldn't pan too quickly across the star field because there are these little white dots on an inky black background. And if you move too fast, you're just going to see them all two or three times. This is just going to stutter, right? The only solution to that was move the camera slower, which explains why 2001 is nine hours long. But, um, <laughs> uh, and, and I was listening to him talk, and I was like, hey, that's like end credits. It's like these little white letters against a sea of black. And if you move too fast, it's going to look bad. That's just how it is. So um, you want to be able to move, scroll slowly enough that the last four or five minutes of your film will actually look good. Let's talk about jitter, all right? So, so scrolling too fast, that's what we call stutter. But jitter is something else. Um, we like to lock our scroll speed to an integer number of pixels per frame. So what I mean is you scroll three pixels per frame. That's the sweet spot. Always aim for that if it's 2K or HD, six, pi uh, six pixels per frame in, in 4K. Um, but if you were to, say, scroll some a fractional amount per frame, say 3.1 pixels per frame. How does, how do you move subpixel, right? And the answer is by shifting the pattern of the gray pixels at the edge of the glyph. So the anti-aliasing pattern will subtly change to sort of give the illusion that you moved a fraction of a pixel. And that looks like that. So if you want to know your credits are jittering, it's because you're moving some subpixel amount. That subpixel motion it makes everything really, really bad. Um, at this point, a lot of people know it. You can solve it in After Effects with, um, you know, if you know a little bit of scripting, you can, you can get away with it. It makes it really hard to target your duration, though, when you're locked into a, to a certain scroll speed. That's where our render engine comes in, too. But I get this call once in a while. It's usually like at night or on a weekend or something. And it's like, Pliny, my credits are jittering. It's all your fault. What have you done? And um, so the first thing I ask is, are you resizing your render at any point in your workflow? And the answer is always, no, 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 no. And the truth is always, yes, they are. Um, so, so where is that happening? Um, this is the most popular blog article I've ever written. All right. I'm not going to get into this tonight. 1152p is my personal white whale. It's my Moby Dick. I, I'm going to try to slay it before I die. Um, but this is a very common workflow bugbear because a lot of post houses, not naming names, um, think that we should set up our post finishing workflows to follow the acquisition format. If you ask me, post finishing workflows should follow the delivery format because that's how the audience is going to see the damn movie, right? Um, so what often happens is certain cameras shoot at this aspect ratio. There is no 1152p standard. DCI container 2K, max 1080 height. That's how it is. Um, 2K is 2048 by 1080. We might not like it, but that's the truth. Um, same with broadcast, of course. So conventional wisdom has it that oversampling is good, right? You shoot for 4K to finish in HD. It's good. You shoot 6K for 4K, fine. But if you're scaling something down by like 6 or 7%, that is really, really bad. 
you are going to use soft in your image. And we have all kinds of cool image algorithms that sharpen it again. But why would you step on your image and then try to undo the damage? Just don't do the damage in the first place. But small amounts of scaling will make your image softer and it will introduce moiré effects. So in certain shots where there's, say, a lot of geometric um, repetition, like a building with lots of windows or a chain link fence, that will suddenly um, pop out. So um, end credits are the canary in the coal mine here because they will show up like that letter G um, really, really obviously. And even when photographic detail in other shots sort of hide the mess that you've made, um, and credits of the canary in the coal mine. That's why it's my white whale, because people always think that, that uh, there was something wrong with the credits. It's because you're resizing the credits. So I've talked a lot. I'm going to just take a break for a sec. You can tell I've kind of thought about this stuff way too much. Um, anyone have any questions before I? Uh... Can you tell me why we are watching credits on like Netflix, where things are never going to be released on a theater, and they're like so small you can't even read it? Or you have the option to. Yeah, you have the option to read it. I always click and watch, but... Um, um, no, I mean, it's, it's, the print is so small on the screen, you can't read it. Um, it depends. So it, it, you're actually bringing up an interesting point that is a perfect segue into this, so thank you. Um, it has to do with legibility. Um, but I do find it interesting that traditionally episodic is always cards, right? Because you're going cut, cut, cut. That makes sense when you're on a clock, if you have a network show. Um, if you're a streamer or if you're HBO or somewhere with no ads, um, some filmmakers are going, oh yeah, I can just take my time. And so uh, Babylon Berlin was a show I watched on Netflix in the last year. And every episode had like a three or four minute cinematic end credit sequence at the end. So that's totally an option if, uh, if you're, um, you know, your show is on a, on, a, on a platform like Netflix or HBO with no ads. I don't know if I answered your question at all. <laughs> Anyone else? You want to hear about Helvetica? Okay. So, um, actually, I, I was the online editor for um, the movie Helvetica, and I produced the DI. Um, really, really loved that film, um, and it sort of made me a bit of a dilettante nerd about typography, as it did, I think, like everyone who ever saw that film. Um, but Helvetica is something called a display font. So, in typography, you have something called a display font, which is meant for large headings. Like, if it's a poster, that's going to be the big, fat font. And then there's something else called a text font, which is meant for paragraphs of text. So the former, legibility isn't much of an issue because the letters are huge and you're probably reading two words or something. So you can get a little more creative, a little more fancy with the letters. No one here has ever read a book that was typeset in Helvetica. And the reason is Helvetica is actually really crappy at small font sizes um, for legibility. And it has to do with a bunch of things. It has to do with how the lowercase e is almost totally closed. And it's just it's, it's, it's a bigger strain on the i. But what we're dealing, so this is Eric Spiekermann. He's a, um, I forget if he's German or Austrian, but he's a graphic designer and typographer. He's definitely a Helvetica hater. But he correctly points out that Helvetica is actually a, um, a negative benchmark when it comes to legibility. So um, please don't use Helvetica when <laughs> you're doing your end titles because um, we're actually dealing, when you're doing end titles, even in 4K, um, we're much more in the realm of web typography than we are in the, in the realm of print typography. 4K isn't actually that many pixels, like compared to say like, print work. Um, and so the typefaces we choose need to be legible on screen, they need to be legible at fairly small point sizes, and they need to be legible in motion. Um, I can have, I can come back and give a two hour long talk about how to pick the right font. I'm not going to do that tonight. Um, but this is not it. What's my favorite? Well, our default template is Open Sans Condensed, which is um, very legible, um, and it has a fairly neutral character. It's a bit condensed, as the name implies, which is safe, uh, space saving, which is good for credits, because the, um, uh, the more horizontal real estate you can preserve, the less vertical real estate you have. And the shorter your credits are, the slower you can scroll. So that should be the goal. Um, so yeah, that's a good one. Open Sans Condensed. Yep. We, we um, work very hard to um, curate completely free and open source fonts because the whole font li uh, licensing thing when it comes to a use case like ours is very weird. I've been trying for years to get through the monotype folks, but they, um, <clears throat> they want a lot of money. Um, so <laughs> let's talk about tax credits. So 
I got a call from the New York governor's office about a year ago, and they wanted to know why like three or four films they had seen recently that came out of our system had the wrong tax credit language in it. Um, now we always tell our customers, you know, you're responsible for the content, blah, blah, blah. And that's true. But I would made a mistake. We have a template project that we sometimes set up customers with if they don't already have their credits ready. Just sort of here's, a, here's sort of like a just template project with a bunch of fake names in it. Um, I left some boilerplate near the bottom just to show here. Here's what it looks like when you credit New York State. And some post supers were just leaving it in there forgetting that that wasn't the actual correct text. Oops. Yeah, and um, there's, no, it, we put in real, and now we've taken it out and say, paste the actual text here, please. This isn't it. But then I was actually leaving in some language that I think it was the correct language for the production incentive. New York State has two different programs. There's a production tax credit and there's a post-production tax credit. And your, and your show is either one or the other. It can't be both. So uh, some folks had just sort of left that in, forgotten about it. Another thing producers will do is copy and paste that language from their last project. They're like, ah, eh, it's probably the same. It's fine. Um, no, it's not fine. So the thing about tax credits is they're encoded into law, right? So when the fine folks at the mayor's office call you up and say, hey, your credits are wrong, they can't give you a pass because they think you're a nice person. Um, they're not empowered to do so. It is literally written into law. So if you get one letter wrong, um, you could suddenly have hundreds of thousands of dollars on the line or even millions of dollars on the line. And that's no joke. Uh, to my knowledge, it's never actually happened, but they don't have the leeway to just sort of let it slide if they think you're cool. All right, so you can't do that. Um, so this is really, really important. I worked on a scripted narrative TV show a number of years ago when I was still in the post world. And um, the post super, my client said, let's just deliver the whole show at once. We felt we should like deliver one episode and maybe get some feedback. But no, we delivered all 13 episodes, all, all deliverables, all derivatives, SR, DigiBeta, DVDs, tons of files, everything for all 13 episodes. And then we get the word that the, the language for the tax incentive was wrong in the credits. Luckily, we didn't make the credits. That so was delivered somewhere else. But it was kind of like, hey, Pliny, um, can you just live in the edit bay for the next week and restrike the whole season for us, please? And I did. Um, so this is really important. In fact, this blog article that we wrote came out of a conversation we had with the, tax, uh, with the mayor's office in New York. And they pretty much asked us to write this word for word because they don't want to have to deal with this again. So don't wing this, please. Any questions on, 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 on that? All right. All right, I'm just going to keep talking then. Ah, oh, this, this is one of my favorite ones. Um, so people love to do little no animals were harmed gags in their end credits because they're the first one to ever think to have thought of that. Um, <laughs> this one actually I think is cool. I think it's okay because the language at the top is pretty much like what it was at the time. This is a film from the 80s, I think, and that's the American Humane logo, and then they put their little gag at the bottom there. Um, but it turns out the phrase no animals were harmed is trademarked by American Humane. You'll notice that little circle R at the end of that phrase. Uh, they've trademarked that phrase. Um, so again, I'm not aware of any cases where someone did a no animals were harmed or no penguins were harmed or whatever sort of joke and um, got slapped hard. But if you're going to be a filmmaker, at worst, you might get a cease and desist. But at best, you just pissed off American Humane, and you're going to have to work with them at some point. So don't. <laughs> don't do that, please. Um, that's it. Those are five, five things I wanted to tell you about end credits. I can come back and talk about 50 more. But um, hang on, hang on, one more thing. We make really cool t-shirts, this, this very stylish t-shirt here. Um, they come in three different styles. We try to be inclusive for all genders and body types. Everyone in this room can get one. Um, yeah, just take a picture <laughs> of the link. It's bit.ly slash lacypug-2019. Um, and I'll, I'll just leave that up for a while. So anyone here, as long as you promise to wear it to set, wear it to edit bay, wear it to whatever, um, we're here to um, dump all our swag on LA. So. That's all I got. If you want to talk to me about Encrawl, come see me afterwards. I'm around. Thanks. Thank you.